Well, I'm happy to tell you that this year we are joined by Jeff Howe, who is our Patriots insider from The Athletic. And that's great news because we're going to have you throughout the season giving some insight based on what you see at the stadium, based on news that breaks throughout any given week. So thanks for joining us. Hey, let's have some fun. Should be good. It's shocking to me that the Texans come to town and I was higher on the Texans and I know it was a seven point game, but in the end, can't we all agree that they were outclassed today in every way? It was a one-sided game basically from start to finish. If Riley McCarron, literally the 53rd guy on the roster, doesn't muff that punt in the fourth quarter, I mean, this is basically a laugher, and that was the only reason there was any drama at all in the fourth quarter. And it all started with quite possibly the biggest question mark. How is the Patriots' defense going to respond after that Super Bowl performance? And they consistently put pressure on Watson, sacked him three times, 12 quarterback hits, but what I liked most was that the assignments were sound, the, con the containment lanes were sound, there were no breakdowns, and it wasn't just getting after him, it was containing him properly, and then they had nine uh, tackles against the run for one yard or less. So again, the, the lanes just weren't there. It wasn't just about making the pressure, it was keeping everybody where they were supposed to be, which means they're getting it mentally right off the bat and that was a big problem last year. Yeah, so you teed me up. Is it too early to dig into this or glean into what they've all been saying about the simplification of the defense, about the fact that Brian has taken it in a way, maybe dumbed it down a little bit, and also Bill's involvement with the defense? What can you tell us about that? I think it's a really good sign because everybody's so optimistic about what Flores has done. And they had some wrinkles. You know, they had some different personnel packages. I liked what they did with Kyle Van Noy. They put him on the edge where he doesn't always play. And who knows how much that'll happen the rest of the season. But you just allow a guy who's just a good athlete to help contain the front side in case Watson wants to again scramble to his front side where he can see everything you saw Van Noy he didn't get any quarterback pressure or any hits on Watson but he had that seven yard loss on the Hopkins run in the early in the third quarter was a tone setting type of play and again I think when you are a defensive coordinator title or not like Flores and you allow guys to do what they're comfortable doing or have fun out there, then you're going to have the ability to reach the room uh, a whole lot easier. They love Flores. They have for basically a decade, however long he's been in the system. Now that he's taking control, there's a lot to like there. The only, only, only caveat that I would say is it too early, the Texans' offensive line is atrocious. I mean, we knew it was bad. What we saw today, I mean, it, it could be in the running for the worst line in the NFL. So maybe you're not going to see it like this every single week from the Patriots' pass rush or front seven perspective, but hey, you can't argue with the start. We take for granted how efficient the Patriots are at the end of a half. And, you know, the Texans played the Patriots game today. They won the toss. They deferred. They were set up to put together a nice drive, score that last set of points, and then come back and get the ball in the second half. If you pick it up just before the two-minute warning in the second quarter, that's a turning point of the game. I mean, it's a 14-6 game. If they score a touchdown there, it's a 14-13 game at the half. He didn't know the two-minute warning was coming. Yeah. They come out with back-to-back -back penalties after that, and then the Patriots execute to perfection after that. Why does it happen that a team melts? down when they face this Patriots team especially Bill O'Brien I mean you know I'll give him credit at least they didn't stay in Waltham this time but yeah it's this it shouldn't happen for a well-coached team I mean O'Brien is a good coach he just he has a terrible time coming into Foxborough from the Patriots side of it I almost thought going into this I'm like all right was about a hundred seconds to go or whatever it was when they took over inside that two-minute warning it's you know what they're good at I mean they scored inside the final minute of the first half something like six, seven, eight times last season. They're great at it. They always have been. But I'm like, okay, the pressure has gotten to Brady. It was getting a little closer in the, the second quarter. You saw the interception that led to the three points. Maybe this is the one time that you want to be conservative because you're not being able to push it downfield as much as you would like. And there they go. Not only do they push it downfield, they allow Philip Dorsett to break out. That really got him going. And, and again, that's like you said, that was the turning point in the game. Negative, unfortunately, Jeremy Hill did not look good. What do you hear buzz in the locker room? They don't like talking about injuries, but all of us saw it on TV. That was a helmet to the knee. Yeah, uh, still quiet at this point in the day. I mean, I would expect information to come out Sunday night, if not Monday. I mean, the MRI is going to be Monday, like it always is. And it just, it didn't look good. And it's a tough break because we don't know how much Jeremy Hill is going to be involved once Sony Michelle is back, assuming Burkhead and James White remain healthy. But he was a good special teamer. And this is a guy who didn't really have a big special teams role in Cincinnati. Comes to New England. You didn't know. Is he's a roster bubble guy. He was going to make it. It was going to have to be on special teams. You saw him show up a bit in practice. He was willing. Everybody in the locker room really liked him. Great, great attitude. Blocks the punt earlier in the game. 
And then, you know, on the turnover, takes James Devlin's shot to the knee because the ball carrier got just, a, I mean, it's a tough break, a brutal game, and it just didn't look good for the knees perspective. What about a stand-up player? Maybe somebody we didn't see a lot from during the preseason, somebody who jumped out today and you said, hey, I know Dorsett you talked about, but somebody besides him perhaps. I was going to go with Dorsett. No, you can't okay. go with him again. I won't go with him. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, Jawan Bentley. I really, yeah. re I mean, how do you know? This kid is dynamite. I mean, this, when you saw the scouting report of him coming out of the draft from Purdue, it was, he sounded like a Landon Roberts, you know, a run stuffing linebacker who was going to be, who's going to struggle in coverage, which all young linebackers do. The best linebackers in the, on the planet, top five, top 10 picks, they struggle in coverage their first couple of years in the league. Juwan Bentley had a play. Early in the game, it was the Texans' second possession on second down where Deshaun Watson wanted to go over the middle uh, to throw at Bentley. But Bentley had a you know, really good job on his assignment, forced Watson to tuck it back in. The pressure started to come from the backside. Watson scrambled, and I think it was an incompletion, led to a third and six, and then eventually a punt on fourth down. But again, you know, just it's little things like that. You know, Bentley's going to struggle. He's going to have some zone issues, as all young guys do. But I, I, it's just one of those little plays early in the game that helped the Patriots maintain some of that early control. He's, he's a great, he's a thumper, but the kid can cover and he's a great athlete. You know everyone's going to be talking about it. Des Bryant tweeting after the game how good he'd look in this Patriots offense because he wouldn't be singled. First of all, explain what's the difference between a vet signing yesterday versus a vet signing tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point because the rule is weird, and I don't understand why it happens, but if you have the veteran status, your salary is fully guaranteed for the entire season if you're on the week one roster. Now that it's going to be week two before Bryant signs, whether it's with the Patriots or anybody, it's basically game by game. You know, if, if you show up and, and the Patriots or whoever signs you, doesn't like you, they can cut you and you don't have to pay any of the remaining balance of the salary, which is important for a guy like that because you're talking upwards of a million dollars if it's a league minimum, who knows how much more he's going to want or sign for. So that is still a, a, it's a good indication, you know, for a team that might want to take a flyer on him but doesn't know what they're going to get inside the locker room. I just don't think, you know, it, it's not a realistic scenario for the Patriots you know if you're going to bring in Des Bryant why wouldn't you have done it six weeks ago because you want to pay him a million bucks or more but you also could have cut him on cut down day you know you bring him in at the beginning of training camp you let him run around I mean the receivers start getting banged up early they knew early Malcolm Mitchell had basically no chance of contributing Jordan Matthews tore his hamstring really early Kenny Britt tore his hamstring in at the end of May early June never recovered they had all these chances to say, you know what, this thing might not shake out the way that they had planned. Bring in Des Bryant now and see what happens. Like Eric Decker, give him a few weeks. I mean, Decker was just shorter than that, but let him run around, see if he does mesh with Brady and everybody else. And if you cut him on Labor Day, then so be it. You know, it could have been a salary thing. Maybe Des Bryant saying, you know what, I have no more opportunities. I will play for the minimum. Just bring me in. If that's the case, I mean, maybe. But I just, I don't, I'll believe it when I see it, and I don't think we're going to see it. Last one is this. As we look ahead, Jacksonville went to New Jersey, beat the Giants on the road. Good win for them. Mm -hmm. I know the Giants aren't the greatest team in the league, but going on the road and beating them in the opener is good. So now Jacksonville comes home. They're going to be riding high. Rematch of the AFC Championship game. How do you first see that one? I mean, look, I'm not going to pick the Patriots to lose this game. And this is... Leonard Fournette went down. I believe he told reporters after the game that he thinks he's going to play through the hamstring injury. So, look, this is going to be like an old-fashioned, you know, physical grudge match type of prove-it game for the Jaguars. I wouldn't be surprised if this gets billed up as, as one of the biggest games in Jaguars history. And the Patriots are going to go down there and, you know, the heat and coming off of a good win against a physical team, a Texans team that, despite their flaws, what we saw, a team that had high expectations, still will have playoff aspirations this season, a physical team. And you know what? They're going to have to go out and do it again against another AFC South team. It's going to be a fun game. The atmosphere is going to be terrific down there. And again, I think there's going to be a lot of hype. You're going to hear those guys talk a little bit. Jeff's going to be with us throughout the year. As I said, you can follow him each and every day, Jeff P. Howe, on Twitter, and also read all his stuff on The Athletic. And your book? October 2nd. Nice. Titled? If These Walls Could Talk, New England Patriots, by myself and Scott Zolak. We alternated words just to keep it fun. You know? <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.